Hey everybody, this is Tony Deligi with Plastics Technology Magazine. I'm joined today by Mike Dorina. Uh, Mike is going to be talking about the new TempSense sensor. Um, we had an article about this in our September issue and wanted to give him a chance to give us a little more detail and kind of walk through some of it. So I guess maybe to get started, Mike, if you want to talk about, I know this is, um, there's been kind of several different iterations of this technology, is that correct? And it, it keeps evolving, if you maybe could walk through the history. Uh, yeah, Tony, thanks uh, for having me here. Um, there's basically uh, one sensor, but we have a, a number of versions, and we're going to call it the uh, low-cost version to the high-cost version. And uh, it stands to reason that low-cost version offers more or less information than the high-cost version. And that's the case we have here. So we have uh, a, uh, a single DAC USB connector that plugs into the um, USB powered rather plugs into the um, a PC and uh, that's the lowest cost version and then we have what we call our melt profiler 7 which is the higher version and uh, in that, in that uh, <clears throat> version we have uh, it's also USB power plugs into a PC but we uh, do statistical analysis um, and we, we break down the uh, data we store it and save it differently um, you know real-time screens uh, uh, so there's a lot more uh, content to it. So with the latest advance, I know um, my colleague Matt Nato has written up an article on that. Maybe if you want to touch on, I, I realize that uh, you've kind of been able to pull some new data or the data is taking you in a new direction. Um, you know, I, you did some case studies as well. If you want to talk about kind of what you were seeing from uh, the equipment that you didn't see before and how you think you'll be able to use it. Yeah, um, that's correct. Um, we, uh, you know, when we first uh, started out with this, uh, we we uh, we didn't really even have a product. We had a sensor that uh, couldn't withstand the uh, rigors of the high pressure and temperature injection molding machine. So we had a ways to go get to move that into the mainstream. Um, and um, so we've been doing we've been doing that that work on um, on our lab machine out here in uh, in in our shop. It's an old Toshiba machine, and um, We've tried a couple different uh, designs uh, to withstand the pressures we, uh, and uh, temperatures. We um, have um, uh, circumvented all those uh, issues at this point. And um, when then we hit the market, fast forward, you know, here we are now. We have, um, you know, we're, we're re reading over time. So temperature over time is way more valuable than just temperature. Um, so we're breaking that down where we can actually see the cycle, the applied force um, during injection and screw rotate um, equals in a, in a closed environment like this equals uh, a rise in temperature. So it's the pressure volume temperature relationships in nature. And, um, and we can extrapolate uh, those uh, curves that are formed and um, generate uh, intervals and calculate the area underneath those those uh, curves, and so those intervals, it turns out, uh, are you know what's driving this new technology forward. We conducted a test where we had uh, one of our partners that uh, has been with us all along testing the data. So if you can look at the the graph and display here, that shows the uh, 100 shots. Um, consecutive shots that were uh, on a, in a stack chart. So they're one, one right on top of the other. And if we uh, look over here on the left-hand side, you can see the distance between uh, you know one temperature and the other and one curve and the other. When we look at the actual pressure that it took to fill the part, and then we look at the part weights, I mean, the part weights were, were pretty good. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't much variance, um, however, the standard deviation of the pressure is 415 uh, psi, and the difference between the uh, minimum and maximum pressure in those 100 shots is over 2,150 uh, pounds per square inch. So you'd say, what would could possibly call cause a difference in the machine needed to to uh, to exert 2,150 more pounds on from one shot to the other? We went in and looked at our thermal data and looked at the curves and um, we we point out um, number shot number seven and, and uh, number 58 and you see the difference between the uh, two 
two shots. The only thing that was that, that we can say that was different was the, uh, the actual heat content or the uh, you know the, the temperature at injection start. And so that extra temperature and or the lack of lack of temperature, if you if you want, um, and lack of heat content um, is a uh, it has to be a reflection on viscosity. And the extra need for viscosity is, is what created this extra need for work. You know, with this, I, I know we had a discussion earlier and you had mentioned um, some of this data was taken on a newer machine and that the machine was able to adjust to those um, variances in, in viscosity. But, you know, perhaps with an older machine, it wouldn't be able to do it. Or even for that newer machine, it, it, it basically equates to a lot more work. So, I mean, you know, maybe if you could talk about some of the insights you get into um, you know, what we're not seeing going on with the machine that this, this data is showing us? Well, first of all, you know, most of the uh, procedures for setting up today, um, you know, the, most of the world follows a fairly stringent um, setup procedure, which we could call scientific molding. It was actually, um, you know, fostered here in the United States, at least the ideology and the terminology. And that is to uh, maybe, you, maybe the, if you really take it in full full bore you would do a viscosity shear rate test on the molding machine that you're using that you're going to mold the, the part in um, so you have the mold place you viscosity shear rate test uh, with the uh, nozzle and um, and the, the screw design and cycle that you're temperatures that you want to use and then once you find out what that that looks like then you find the flat part of the curve and that establishes say the minimum uh, velocity that you want to use and that would be the velocity that you would use to fill the part 95 to 98 percent full. When you do that, then you look at well, how much pressure did it take to get to this point? You know, from point A to point B, how much pressure did it take? And then you would set a variance on top of that. So you would give the machine a little latitude, but I doubt if you would normally give it 2,000 more pounds per square inch latitude on a, right. on a 12,000 pound to fill part. Uh, you know, most people would give uh, you know three, 400 psi. So uh, there was two two things here that happened. And uh, obviously they gave the uh, machine enough latitude to say, okay, basically go do whatever you need to do to get to that position in the same, same time period. So maintain that velocity. Um, and then uh, number two, some of the older machines, just you're not, you're not, you're just not capable of making those setups uh, set up like that. Now we're, now we can see real time what's going on. We can, um, make some inferences as to uh, what, what's changed because we can look at all the machine data that's normally offered that quite frankly doesn't tell you whether you made a good or bad part, doesn't know if you made a good or bad part, but there's a lot of data there. So if you can um, employ one into the other, then, uh, then, uh, you know, then I think we have a, uh, a, a you know, new technology that we can use. You talked a little bit about, um, you know, kind of the traditional process, especially from a scientific molding perspective of, you know, establishing a curve and finding kind of that sweet spot um, pressure wise and speed wise. Um, how would maybe that setup process look different if a, if a molder was using technology like this? First of all, it reveals hidden information. When at least one point in time, we talked about the taking out the mystery of uh, you know, melt temperature and, and, and melt viscosity. And it's basically, I mean, temperature is related to viscosity in this, in, in, a, in a polymer, okay? That's, that's all there is to it, right? Yeah. There's, uh, there's other uh, um, elements in nature where temperature doesn't mean that much, okay? Um, and everything, everything grows and, and, and everything shrinks on temp, based on te temperature. But in, in this case, um, if, if we're able to read it, this temperature in a closed vessel, we can make inferences on viscosity. We just have to do viscosity shear rate tests and look at one versus the other, and then uh, make some correlation uh, models, you know, to, to prove it out and, and and make sure it follows follows with the correlation model. Make adjustments if you need to. What we would reveal would dictate maybe making a change, okay, and helping with uh, the the adjustments that. Uh, that the operator is in control of, uh, which is basically just temperature and, and uh, or uh, yeah, temperature settings on a barrel and uh, screw speed and back pressure um, on the, on machine variables, and uh, and try to find a uh, in, in this case here try to find the lowest uh, variance in um, in temperature, and if need be, um, 
you know, the, the, the cycle time and uh, residence time uh, may dictate that, uh, lo and behold, you actually need a, a better screw design to melt the plastic. Well, yeah, in addition to um, maybe determining that your, your screw is not fit for the job it's trying to do, um, I think you, you also mentioned earlier in a previous discussion that uh, in some of this testing, you were able to maybe determine if you're getting like some slippage with, with the, um, uh, the nozzle. Um, or, you know, do, do you get some, in, I guess, insights into the check ring with this potentially that you, you might see issues that you wouldn't see otherwise? That's correct. If you notice, I, I just showed, these, these are all different parts and every part has its own thermal template. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is injection start and this is max temperature, which usually indicates max fill. And then, uh, and then you have a cooling part, and then this little jiggly line here usually is where uh, the uh, screw starts to rotate again. Sometimes those are more exasperated, depending on the pack pressure that you use. Um, but every uh, every um, had, every part has its own thermal curve. If you notice these uh, lines here that we see, they're all straight lines. This has a little tiny message in it that uh, might, might want to look at but this is this is a small slippage this is a pretty large one so mm. what happened here the you know you said in go in injection forward you say go and uh the screw moves hits the uh, the, the sliding ring check valve uh, actually rear seat and touches the uh the back the back seat and or the ring touches the rear seat and then um, plastics displaced and it happens and then all of a sudden this thing occurs and say well what happened there well the, the valve slipped actually and then it caught again and then it then it, then it continued to displace the material so I have uh, a number of graphs to show this in, in a much worse fashion and as well as um, the uh, you know bad bad parts that occurred due, due to that uh, short shots we, we took these 41 consecutive parts here. This is on a sodic machine. It's also a really a new machine. Um, yeah. We deliberately, uh, we, we looked at the data. We statistically analyzed our, our data. There's a production statistics. So this is where we look at min, max, and average for our three variables. Mm -hmm. And then we take, we took those and then we, we can go in, we, we can set an alarm threshold. So um, we looked at the minimum, maximum, set a threshold then we um, set that set that information 436 435 then we uh, went and measured the you know full uh, full part then we deliberately made a, a short shot but what well, didn't take much to do this and just changed the uh, pressure slightly and mm -hmm. uh, this part was not full and you see the difference between 453 and 402 is actually an 11% difference but there's a real short one but then yeah. then uh, if you look at the, the, what that means is the the machine the stroke of the machine was only 0 0.0728 millimeter hmm. well that machine when that had no clue that it made that difference and the pressure difference um was not significant to uh to, to prove that it made a good part or bad part so the machine didn't know if it made a good or bad part it's just right. that um and it's just that we, we were able to tell by um, looking at the uh, this little difference in in the uh, thermal template that occurred here uh, generated you know a, an area difference that mag that magnifies the uh, you know the uh, uh, what's going on inside the machine. So you know you can look at pressure, you see pressure variances, you don't know how to deal with that. Um, and then, um, and then you, you look at cushion and you say, well, can I use cushion as my variance? And no, uh, sorry, can't do it. Um, and then, so basically the machine doesn't know if it made a good or bad part yet. By yeah. putting this technology in, I think, I mean, that's our certain, that's certainly our goal to, to be able to tell you whether, you whether you made a good or bad part. I understand that you have uh, a handful or even more of these systems kind of out in the field. Um, have you learned anything from uh, your customers and how they're using it about maybe things you didn't anticipate and, and ways it can be applied that, that are kind of taking it in new directions? Yeah, um, I think there's uh, three or four different areas that uh, people are interested in. Number one, um, there's a large uh, manufacturer in Indiana that 
um, makes a child the safety product and they're using it for product liability. Okay. So they, they actually have to trace back, um, you know, from the pellet to the final product being shipped out the door. And, and in, the, in that case, they have, they have been steadily gathering more date process date related data um, to prove that they, you know, that they made a good part. We have another guy that, uh, another molar that is in, in the medical field that um, wants to prove uh, to their customer that um, the variances that they see are not always machine related variances, but they're polymer related variances. And so they're using they're using our Mel Profiler one and two to actually uh, prove that um, the variances that they're occurring are polymer related, and therefore they should have the latitude to make machine control changes. Okay. You know, the PPAPs and those uh, you know um, medical uh, uh, folks they can't they can't change their setup. You know it's like oh right. it's impossible. But so. I think that is really cool that uh, that they're doing that. They're trying to do that, so they're basing their setups on on uh, on thermal thermal data. No, I mean, certainly there's been a lot of advances in like instrumenting a mold to to kind of know what's going on in the mold cavity, but a lot of the aspects of the injection unit are still kind of a a mystery, <laughs> which yeah, you've been yeah. trying to address for a while. Yeah, that's true, and you know, and there's uh, there's no question that the uh, you know, in, in in cavity molds or or in cavity sensors are uh, you know are, are maybe closer to the to the point. So you know, this is this is data right here that shows um, you know the 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 yellow is a cavity sensor. We just superimpose one on top of the other, and the other one is nozzle sensor. Yeah. And this area difference under this blue curve is the area under the nozzle. And you see how significant or how different this thermal curve was from this thermal curve and right. here's we delivery did not fill the, the part right so in the cavity okay. said, well, I didn't see it at all or hardly seen any it does it always sees temperature coming so the exit gas that's moving past the our sensor you can see that there's there is temperature and there is temperature here but mm -hmm. we didn't we didn't get the rise in temperature which means that the plastic never actually touched the sensor itself so so our goal is to find out um how difficult it is or is to weed out the the, the, the position where um, we can tell right from the nozzle or the say the machine can tell that it made a good or bad part versus the mold telling it made a good or bad part so gotcha. we just you know we're working on working with some people that what is it cavitation that makes this difference is it thin wallness is it you know what, what is it that's going to make the difference between we're gonna we're gonna say okay well you know what our we our hands are up we give up um, you need to put a um, a sensor in the cavity to make the full determination. Well, uh, Mike, you know thank you very much for all the information. We appreciate you uh, sharing the story with us of plastics technology. Um, encourage everyone to check out the article as well, and we look forward to future developments with this technology and others that you're working on. Yeah, hey, thank you very much, Tony. Appreciate that. Appreciate the time.